Good afternoon. My name is John Fetting. And on behalf of the Committee for the Brin Visiting Professorship and the Oncology Center, which sponsors the professorship, I would like to welcome you to the 39th David Barrett Brin Lecture in Medical Ethics. The Brin Lecture uh, is the centerpiece of the Brin Visiting Professorship, which involves two days of activities. The Visiting Professorship honors the memory of David Barrup Brin. David received a bone marrow transplant at Hopkins for acute lymphocytic leukemia. He died approximately one year later in August of 1980 from recurrent leukemia. This visiting professorship was endowed by David's family and friends to honor his memory, especially his generous spirit and gentle curiosity. It is a great pleasure to have the Brin family with us today. We are joined by David's brother, Joe, and Joe's wife, Dinah, and their daughter, Lily. Annie Brin and her husband, Mark Billion, are also with us. Margaret Carrillo and Herb Engelsberg, very close friends of the Brin family and longtime supporters of the Brin Visiting Professorship, are here as well. Welcome back to you all. The Oncology Center would like to thank its co-hosts for the Visiting Professorship, the Bioethics Institute, directed by Jeff Kahn, and the Hospital Ethics Committee, co-chaired by Mark Hughes and Cinda Rushton. Chris Dell, uh, my extraordinary assistant, has made this happen as she has every year. Chris, you've done another wonderful job. Thank you very much. Uh, before introducing Dr. Winia, let me explain uh, the Zoom protocol, if you will. Um, Sam Lee, the, the Zoom wizard, is running this meeting in the background. He will keep microphones and video cams of all participants off until Dr. Winia finishes his talk. At that time, he will release his hold on the microphones. If you'd like to ask a question, turn your microphone on. Uh, I will see that someone has turned their microphone on and I will call on folks in the order uh, they turned on their microphones. It's now my pleasure to introduce our 39th visiting professor, Matthew Winia. Dr. Winia joins a wonderful group of scholars it has been our good fortune to host as Bryn visiting professors over the past 39 years. Dr. Winia is a professor of medicine and public health at the University of Colorado, where since 2014, he has been the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities on the Anschutz Medical Campus. Dr. Winia leads strategic planning and programs in bioethics and humanities across medical, nursing, pharmacy, dental, public health, and graduate degree programs, as well as teaching and outreach across all four CU campuses. Dr. Winnie received his MD degree at the University of Oregon. He trained in internal medicine at the Deaconess, where he was a chief resident. He received an MPH at Harvard and had fellowship training in ID and health services research at Tufts. Prior to moving to Colorado, Dr. Winnie has served from 2000 to 2013 as director of the AMA's Institute for Ethics. He led AMA research programs in bioethics and later in patient safety. He used health services research methods to explore issues in medical ethics and professionalism, public health ethics, health disparities, and related topics. This work resulted in more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and numerous additional book chapters, books, published letters, and reports. Among his other many accomplishments at the AMA, he increased the reach and profile of the AMA among both academic researchers and clinical practitioners working in bioethics, patient safety, and health policy. 
In work that has great resonance for today, Dr. Winnie led the project on the history of African Americans in organized medicine. This work resulted in a publication in JAMA that prompted the AMA to apologize for its history of segregation and discrimination and led to significant ongoing uh, AMA investment in the Commission to End Healthcare Disparities in collaboration with the NMA and the NHMA. Dr. Winia is a member of the American Academy of Sciences and a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. He is a fellow of the Hastings Center. He is on the editorial board of the American Journal of Bioethics. This year's Bryn Visiting Professorship comes amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Hopkins has faced many challenges over the years, but I dare say none has presented more of a threat on so many levels. I believe that our community has responded magnific magnificently. We've had strong, visible leadership, and there has been very substantial compliance by members of our community with directives of our leadership. We have pulled together. There has been great teamwork on just about every level. That said, we haven't gotten everything right nor is COVID-19 letting up. There is so much to do, much of it in relatively unfamiliar territory. We must learn and reflect as we go. Dr. Winia has kindly agreed to help with this learning and reflecting. His topic for the Bryn Lecture today is protection, proportionality or panic, ethics and the police powers of public health. Welcome, Dr. Winia. Thank you so, so much, John. Um, that was a lovely introduction and it reminds me how intimidating it is um, to come to Johns Hopkins and talk about ethics and public health. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether I should have picked a different topic. Um, <laughs> the, um, the other thing I wanna say uh, before I get started is um, John sent me a really beautifully um, articulated description of, uh, of David Barrett Brin before, um, as we were sort of talking about what the topics might be that would be of interest to this group. And, um, and I have to say, I was, I was really um, struck because, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I was really struck because uh, it, it sort of resonated with me that he talked about how uh, Dave was a, apparently a, a vigorous young man um, with a tremendous sense of humor, tremendous grace, athleticism. I think he said, love of music, love of poetry. But then he, but then he went on to, to write that that's not what this um, lectureship celebrates of his life. Rather, uh, this lectureship is supposed to celebrate, and I'm gonna quote here, the respect, esteem, and gentle curiosity with which David approached his fellow travelers. And um, I, first of all, I have to say, ethicists sometimes have a reputation of being um, judgmental, uh, being critical. And probably if you're an ethicist listening to this, you're thinking, what's so wrong with that? Uh, judgment, critique, excellence in argumentation, you know, who doesn't admire those traits? Um, but I will say, I, my son finally convinced me to watch The Good Place and I know I'm really late to that party, um, but the running gag in this TV show is that everyone hates ethicists and moral philosophers for exactly these reasons, because they're always sort of telling you what you shouldn't do. And, and what David Brin appears to have learned um, in his uh, too short life is that what ethics is really good for is the exploration of really challenging issues where people uh, of good um, will can come down on different sides. And um, maybe someone who's really good at, at what he described, at respect, esteem, at general curiosity, can bring uh, light to some otherwise polarized and often emotional issues. And that is something we could certainly use today. And I think maybe that is the ethicist's true calling. Um, and it's certainly what I'm gonna, it's certainly what I'm going to try to, to do today in David's honor. So 
Um, let me start by just saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little about the emotional context of outbreaks. And then I'm gonna talk about the legal context of outbreaks. And then we'll talk about the ethical challenges. Um, I did put a careful uh, asterisk on the legal frameworks. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna talk about some court cases because I find them fascinating and I find this history fascinating. Um, but uh, but if, if you choose to take any of what I say and act upon it, do so at your, uh, at your own risk. Um, I'm then gonna, we're gonna move into the ethical issues and I tend to clump the ethical issues of pandemic planning and response into these three buckets. There are rationing or resource allocation dilemmas. There are issues related to our responsibilities to each other um, to show up for work despite the risk, um, perhaps to share things with others that you might still want yourself, that kind of thing. Um, and then there are restrictions on personal liberties. So these are you know, closures of businesses, mask mandates, vaccine requirements, and so on. And that's where um, I'm really gonna sort of hone in because these are, uh, these are all complicated, difficult um, uh, issues that involve multiple competing um, sort of ethical principles, if you will. There is, by the way, I'll, I'll just acknowledge a fourth R, uh, which would be research. Um, and ethical issues in research during the pandemic are fascinating. Could easily spend an hour on that, but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hone in today on these. Let's start though. Oh, this is my disclaimer slide. I I'm required to put this up. I don't have relevant financial relationships to disclose. We do have three programs that are intended to generate some revenue. Um, they they generally do not generate all that much revenue, but um, our hard call podcast um, is maybe the one that's most relevant today because this is a this is a podcast where we take an issue where there really are good arguments on both sides and we try to tease apart um, why folks might come down on one side or the other. And then we ask people to vote um, at the end. What would you do if you were in this circumstance? So let's start with this historical example. Um, this, is, and I'll ask you to just put your, um, put your answer in the chat um, if you know what this person has. This is a disease that was very common uh, it would uh, arise in outbreaks uh, across Europe, mostly through the 10th through the 13th centuries. Um, the infection risk was considerably higher among uh, the poor uh, because of crowded living conditions, poor uh, nutrition, um, and so on. People who had underlying illnesses, comorbidities, were more uh, prone to this than others. People who caught this were often called unclean. Um, they were uh, they would develop uh, patches of their skin that would be uh, insensate that they had no sensation in. So it was very easy for them to get infections. Um, this infection tends to I'm not I'm not seeing chats. Oh, there they are. Sorry, I have to look at a different screen apparently to see the chat. So I'm going to guess someone has gotten this by now. There we go. We've got at least uh, four or five people who know this is Hansen's disease, uh, formerly known as leprosy. And this is uh, sort of a classic uh, presentation of uh, a face with uh, what's called leonine facies. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so with permission uh, of the patient. Um, and it tends to you know, create these uh, areas of the, of, the, of the body that are more in the extremes where it's colder. Uh, the bacillus that causes this uh, replicates better in the cold. And so you would see the collapse of the bridge of the nose, a buildup of these bacilli under the skin and what's called a leonine face. Um, and these patients were often refused access to hospitals. Um, people in Spain who developed the stigmata of this illness were literally declared legally dead uh, while still living. Uh, in Norway, famously, people with, uh, with Hansen's disease had cowbells placed around their necks so that others uh, would avoid them on the street. And in many instances, uh, including at a couple places in the US, patients were put into so-called leprosaria or uh, colonies like the one uh, at Kalapapa in Molokai. And leprosy uh, or Hansen's disease is really the, um, the paradigm example of a contagious illness that creates a stigma. Um, and it's also a paradigm of an epidemic disease that hits those who are already marginalized hard. And we knew when COVID came along uh, 
um, that it would hit poor areas um, and disadvantaged communities um, harder than the rest. This is always the true, always the case, all essentially every um, pandemic, every epidemic. Even if you can say that this disease does not discriminate, um, it can infect anyone. Um, but the reality, of course, is that uh, like Mexico was essentially seeded um, with coronavirus from Colorado. Uh, a group of wealthy uh, Mexico City residents came to Vail uh, and went skiing and brought the coronavirus back to Mexico where it rapidly uh, left the uh, well-to-do areas and really devastated the, the uh, lower socioeconomic status communities. By the way, I spoke to this report from the LA Times and said, who said the same essentially happened in California. The first people to catch coronavirus in uh, Southern California were people who had traveled to Europe and to China. So they were people who lived in the, in the hills uh, around Los Angeles. But of course it rapidly left those hills and really devastated the rest of the community much more so. Okay, next, uh, so that's stigma, uh, discrimination. Um, next illness, this one, um, you may not get it from the first uh, from the first picture here, but you will certainly get it from the second. So I'm going to hold off for a second on the second and just say that this is a sexually transmitted illness. Uh, many people uh, believe that it was brought back from the New World uh, by Columbus to Spain and it swept through Europe. Um, it caused a considerably different syndrome than uh, what we see today. Uh, when people caught this. Uh, in the 1490s, it caused uh, really large swellings, often uh, pustular, uh, very painful, and sometimes rapidly fatal even. Um, and I'll give you the second, uh, the second image, which uh, for many of you, this is gonna give it away. Um, so this is, uh, this is syphilis, which um, at the time uh, when it was an epidemic disease in Europe in the 14, 1500s, um, it was uh, also known as the great pox. Uh, and that's because it was distinct from the smallpox, right? So smallpox had tiny um, lesions and this had very large pustular lesions. Uh, they were often described as Ulrich von Hutton says here, like acorns, um, that they were uh, large with this uh, sort of a cap on top. And when the cap broke off, um, pus and blood would break from uh, within, and um, and it was apparently uh, very stinky. Um, it was widely recognized uh, at this time that uh, the cause of this uh, was uh, sexual interaction. Um, they said it may come by drinking off with a pocky person, but it is especially caught when uh, one pocky person doth sin in lechery uh, with the other. Syphilis, by the way, comes from this poem. Uh, written um, at around this time, um, and it, uh, it, it so syphilis was the name of a shepherd uh, in Haiti who insulted the sun god uh, of Haiti and was struck with the pox. But you can also see here that it's a uh, syphilis, uh, and I apologize, I don't really know Latin, but Morbus Gallicus is the French disease, um, and I think syphilis is an excellent example of an outbreak. Uh, for which we seek to find someone else to blame. So, um, so this probably travels from Spain to other countries, um, although there's dispute about this, but in any event, the Italians end up calling it either the French pox or the Spanish pox. The French end up calling it the Neapolitan disease. The English end up calling it the French pox. The Poles call it the mal des Allemands or Germans. And the Russians call it the mal polonaise uh, or the Polish uh, illness. So everyone wants to name the disease after where they think it came from. And preferably, it will have come from someplace that you don't like. And so this notion, you know, nothing that happened in this pandemic has not been seen before. And the notion that you would name a, a new illness after uh, the place where you think it came from um, and all, that also happens to be a, a sort of enemy state uh, is not at all shocking. Okay, last of the three uh, quick uh, historical examples about sort of the emotional context of an outbreak. Um, and this one is a very serious, very acute illness, um, often causing very high fever, massive swollen lymph nodes, 
uh, it can cause thousands of deaths in a very short period of time. Um, this will probably give it away just by, by the sort of uh, period of the artwork. Um, you know, literally tens of thousands of people dying in very short periods of time, often um, experiencing thrombosis and necrosis of the digits, giving it, um, pro most people think this is how the term black death um, arose. And again, by now everyone will know this is Yersinia pestis, uh, the plague. Um, and it's, uh, it is, uh, of course, the, the, the uh, famous image uh, of doctoring from the plague is the doctor's robe. Um, and this is a, a robe that was uh, drenched in, it was made of muslin typically, and then it would be dipped in wax. So it's a very hot, sticky robe that drapes all the way to the ground. And then you wear a mask that has a beak on it. The beak would be filled with noxious um, or pleasant, uh, different kinds of um, different kinds of smells. Um, and the whole idea of this, of course, is to prevent um, the vapors from coming in and, and getting to you. Uh, the germ theory of disease did not exist yet. So um, the vapors in the room where the per person with plague was were supposed to be kept out. And my favorite quote of this uh, is from a priest in Italy who said this robe is so hot and uncomfortable and he thought it was probably useless against the plague it was good for only one thing, and that's to protect from the fleas, um, because it drapes all the way to the floor of flea and is, and is covered in wax. Fleas can't nest in it, um, which this is where I really miss having a live audience, um, because I hope at least a few of you are chuckling um, at the fact that fleas, of course, are how plague is transmitted. Um, and plague is an excellent example of the issues around um, fear, and, um, and constraints on liberty in order to protect uh, the larger community. So um, it's hard, I think, today for us to even in, imagine what life would have been like um, during the early plagues of Europe where, you know, uh, 25 million people died within just a few years um, between a, a quarter and half of the entire population. Um, and in many communities, the whole community would be just wiped out. This was a very aggressive disease. Probably a lot of it was pneumonic plague. So uh, Boccaccio said for people would breakfast with their kinfolk and the same night would be supping with their ancestors in the next world. There were um, communities where, you know, the like that image uh, just full of, uh, of bodies in the back of a cart um, where hundreds of people were dying per day. So, you know, considerably more scary um, actually than, than what we are going through today, or maybe even what we can possibly imagine going through today. Uh, the term quarantine comes from the Quaranta Giorni, the 40 days that ships, uh, and this is the, the, the harbor at Dubrovnik, which was at that time Italian. Um, this is probably where the notion of quarantine was originally developed. It was uh, for this port city uh, of Dubrovnik. So let's turn now um, to the legal context of this third R, the restrictions on liberty. And apologies, there's so many things we could talk about uh, with regard to ethics in this pandemic, um, crisis standards of care, vaccine allocation, all the triage dilemmas, um, responsibilities to treat in the face of personal risk, responsibilities of our country to share vaccine with other countries. Um, all of these are worthy of discussion and hopefully we'll get to a few of them in the discussion. But I'm gonna turn now to quarantine, isolation, business closures, other types of restrictions on liberty where you essentially ask one person to sacrifice in order to protect the larger community. And you can't really talk about this without spending a few minutes on the legal context. And um, I'll start with international uh, legal context. And again, without delving into international law, I'll just say that um, back in the 80s, there were a number of uh, essentially dictators who declared martial law or a state of emergency, ostensibly because their nation faced some kind of a public health threat. Um, and the United Nations um, uh, essentially recognized that there was a tremendous risk of abuse, um, that uh, coercive measures, both in public health and other ways, uh, might be implemented um, in ways that were not appropriate or uh, guided by ethics. And so uh, they had a group of lawyers get together 
in Syracuse, Italy, and essentially laid out uh, what they call the, the, the uh, I think it's called the limitation and derogation provisions um, of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. Um, so these are the, these are the things, that the, the constraints that must be met in order to limit someone's um, civil or political rights um, in international law. Um, and the, I think the most important piece here is that you should be using the least restrictive means appropriate to the reasonable achievement of public health goals. And I put this up in part because for those of you who uh, know very much about the US constitution and constitutional law, this looks a lot like what we have in the US constitution with due process, equal protection, um, and the idea that uh, you can restrict individual liberties only if the state has a compelling interest, only if the intervention is well targeted, if you're using the least restrictive means necessary, and if there's some form of due process. Um, in the US, uh, these, uh, these uh, the right to sort of abridge personal liberties, almost uh, all of them sit with the states. Um, if there is a public health emergency and the states request it, they can have the federal government step in. But otherwise, federal um, regulations are, or federal abilities um, to implement uh, police powers for public health protection are considerably more limited. They are not, however, um, gone entirely. And in fact, one of the things that we've seen over the last few years including before the pandemic, but during the Ebola outbreak, for example, is use of um, the Public Health Service Act, Section 361 in particular, that allows the Secretary of Health and Human Services to take measures to contain communicable diseases that are coming in from foreign countries or they're going between states. So this is uh, under the Commerce Clause um, of the Constitution. And so the CDC can act on behalf of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And, um, and it is constitutional for uh, federal agents, for example, to quarantine people. This is how um, the folks who came off the cruise ships uh, were able to be legally quarantined when they arrived in the US um, under federal custody. Um, it also, by the way, is why the CDC has said that they are authorized to issue a moratorium on evictions. Right? A moratorium on evictions is clearly a constraint on the liberty of people who own apartment buildings um, or other rental properties. And essentially, the CDC has made the argument that um, if uh, left to the sort of state of nature, in the case of a pandemic, as we're experiencing, mass evictions are likely to arise if you don't prevent that from happening. And evictions have been shown to spread COVID-19 because people who end up homeless end up in uh, tight quarters and they communicate uh, the disease. So that will thwart our national efforts to contain the virus. And as a consequence, um, they look at the studies that show evictions lead to um, higher rates of uh, transmission of COVID. And therefore the uh, federal government is allowed to, um, to prevent evictions. Um, and this has stood, uh, so far it's stood for six months now. Um, let me go back in time to, uh, to the early cases because I, I think these are, are really important as a grounding uh, and an understanding of where uh, the legal context sits today. Um, the, the oldest case about quarantine that I know of is Gibbons v. Ogden, which is from 1824. And that's a case that essentially um, cemented the uh, 10th Amendment um, statement that police powers for public health purposes are largely reserved to the states for activities within their borders. And it specifically talks to the issue of quarantine and isolation, saying that quarantine laws form a portion, I'm quoting here, a portion of that immense mass of legislation which embraces everything within the territory of a state not surrendered to the federal government. Um, so, uh, so that's the baseline. And then in 1900, uh, there are a series of small outbreaks of plague um, in San Francisco, California. And uh, one of the things that they try to do in California is to force inoculation of everyone in Chinatown with uh, what's called the half-kind vaccine. Um, it's a very toxic vaccine. Uh, 
maybe a one or two percent mortality rate. Um, uh, but it's maybe effective, actually. There's still debate about this. Um, definitely experimental at this time. Uh, the whole notion of inoculation um, was uh, pretty experimental at this time. But this is turned back uh, by the Supreme Court, the forcible inoculation. Um, and so what the city decides to do, um, and the state too, essentially, because um, both the city and the state are feeling pummeled by bad publicity um, because they have this outbreak. Um, although the extent of the outbreak is, uh, is debated even, even today. Um, but anyways, they decide to um, essentially put a quarantine, a cordon sanitaire around the entire of Chinatown um, in San Francisco. What they do on top of this, however, is they realize there are a few businesses on the border of Chinatown on the same street next to the Chinese businesses, but owned by white people. And they allow the local public officials to exempt those businesses. So those businesses, people can come and go. Uh, those houses, people can go. If a white person um, happens to live in Chinatown, they can come and go. So these kind of carve outs that are clearly racist, um, they're designed um, because there is a belief, a pseudo scientific belief that um, people from China uh, and other so-called Orientals at the time, and I'm putting that in scare quotes, but that is the terminology um, that was used at the time, that those, that, that those communities were more susceptible to plague, they were more likely to catch it, and also more likely to end up uh, transmitting it to others. There were plenty of calls to raise Chinatown to the ground um, as a result of this. Um, and in 1900, in this uh, really terrific case, um, the Supreme Court essentially says, no, you cannot discriminate in your public health um, activities. And this uh, carve out sort of um, provision makes this uh, a discrimination and it's not an allowable discrimination um, because it's not justifiable. Um, and then two years later, another case comes which also involves a cordon sanitaire, this time in New Orleans around the harbor. And the Supreme Court says, there you are allowed to enact and enforce a quarantine because it's targeted to an area where you think disease activity is particularly likely. So these two cases saying, if it's discriminatory, you can't do it, but if it's targeted, you can, um, were sort of the law of the land. Uh, and still, by the way, these both are good law. Uh, no, uh, they've never been overturned um, in the years since. Uh, and you will see cases um, during the Ebola outbreak that specifically reference to the Compagnie Francaise case in particular. Um, the other extreme of these, uh, where the Supreme Court has allowed a, what they, essentially a public self-defense argument came 27 years later. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, first, we have to talk about Jacobson because this is the forcible vaccination case that is routinely cited, again, still good law, um, uh, still routinely cited and still uh, allows people to be vaccinated, um, not so much against their will, because the case here was uh, a smallpox outbreak and smallpox inoculation was required for everyone in Boston. Um, and the penalty, if you refused, was a $5 fine. So you were not being forced um, to do this uh, at gunpoint. You didn't weren't held down um, to, to get this vaccine. But there was a significant fine, $5 in 1905 is a, was a considerable amount of money. Um, and so Jacobson, uh, who argued that uh, he should not be required to take the vaccine, um, nor pay the fine, uh, lost in this case. And the argument here was essentially that um, you have to, within a, a shared community, have some areas where people do stuff that constrains their, that, that is a constraint on their personal liberty. Um, and that's in order for everyone to have some level of real liberty. If you were always at threat by your neighbor because your neighbor could do whatever they wanted, um, that would not be true liberty. And that the public has a right to defend itself when someone comes in and poses a threat. Um, so this is uh, so this is the sort of public self-defense argument um, that uh, this is in 1905. By 1927, uh, we have passed 
through most of what, what is now called the progressive era of medicine. And this notion that you can compel people to do something uh, essentially against their will in order to protect the larger community has, has really expanded. And so the famous sentence uh, or phrase from this um, case of uh, Kerry Buck versus Bell is the last sentence, three generations of imbeciles are enough. But I highlighted the sentence before that because um, this is a public health case. It's about the public health police power to protect the larger community from a woman who was seen as posing a threat of producing multiple babies, all of whom would be end up being becoming wards of the state. So this is entirely within the frame of eugenics. Um, it, it, Carrie Buck, by the way, uh, to uh, as far as uh, as anyone can tell today, was not um, an imbecile. Uh, she was uh, her her mother probably had some kind of cognitive disability and was in a as a, and was institutionalized. She was um, taken care of by a foster family. She was probably raped uh, by a, a member of that family and a, a nephew. It sounds like, um, and she, that's how she became pregnant. And once she was pregnant, the foster family. Um, didn't want to acknowledge the rape and said she was promiscuous and that was evidence that she was imbecilic and that's how she ends up in front of the court. The baby, by the way, because three generations are her mother, Carrie herself, and the baby. Um, the way they tested the, uh, this was a, a newborn baby, so the way they tested the uh, the cognitive ability of the baby was by swinging a, a quarter in front of the baby's eyes to see if the baby would follow the quarter and they thought the baby didn't follow the quarter well. And that was how they knew that this baby like uh, Carrie and her mother would end up being institutionalized. The baby, by the way, only lived I think to fourth or fifth grade um, and then died of, an Ill, of a contagious illness. Um, but she had normal uh, cognition throughout that time. She was a you know, B and C student in school. Um, so, so the question that faces us today and has, and has faced us um, you know, for generations now is where does any given intervention sit in this spectrum of public health interventions? Is it on the one hand, a pretty obviously reasonable infringement on liberty, like a requirement for a smallpox vaccination? Or is it a clear overreach of public health police powers like forcible sterilization? And things will fall within that spectrum from pretty obvious everyone agrees to pretty obvious everyone agrees no. But everything in the middle um, fall sort of within this gray space. And you can see, you know, this is from last week, um, Chief Justice Roberts uh, in, the, in the majority opinion on the South Bay United Pentecostal Church versus Gavin Newsom case, um, which has been going on for almost a year now. Um, but this last, uh, this last judgment, essentially, he says, yeah, yeah, federal courts owe significant deference to politically accountable officials. Um, and to people who have background, competence, and expertise to assess public health. But that deference, although it's broad, has its limits. Um, and the, the Kagan dissent, this, by the way, the whole document, um, all the dissents and all of the uh, approvals on this case are only a, a few pages long. It's really well worth reading uh, because it seems to be like they're almost reading completely different public health orders. Elena Kagan clearly sees the rules um, California is trying to apply here to mass gatherings as applying equally to both religious and secular mass gatherings. And that's what the state says, um, that they apply equally. But if you read the opinions of Roberts and the concurring majority, they seem to believe that mass gatherings are somehow being targeted for special restrictions. And they seem to believe that religious gatherings ought to be treated more like um, you know, a hardware store or a hair salon um, than they are like a political rally or a lecture or other sort of mass gatherings. The explanation that Chief Justice Roberts gives is this, and I'll quote here, he says, the state's present determination that the maximum number of adherents who can safely worship in the most cavernous cathedral might end up being zero 
um, in a in a you know in the worst case scenario with a massive outbreak. He says this appears to reflect not expertise or discretion, but instead insufficient appreciation or consideration of the interests at stake. Kagan, meanwhile, um, I put her uh, a quote up here, which, which I thought was uh, nicely said, but she also um, goes on to say the scope of this order raises real questions about when any kind of capacity limits are actually gonna be permissible, or if they are never permissible, if you're talking about a church service. Um, so is it never allowed to ban indoor church services um, or is it only in this case? And if so, why this case? Because there wasn't uh, really a, an explanation. She, I'll, I'll quote again, she says, do the answers to these questions or similar ones turn on record evidence about epidemiology or on naked judicial instinct. So she says, uh, policymakers trying to decide what they can and cannot do are gonna have a hard time with this decision because it doesn't say why exactly this uh, rule um, was, not, um, was not allowed. But this is where we're at in terms of uh, the, the legal background. So let me um, move now to ethics. Um, and I'm realizing that we're really close to time. So I think I'm going to have to go really fast um, through this. Can, uh, Sam, can you tell me whether I'm actually supposed to be done in like five minutes or am I misreading the slide? Uh, you have about 17 minutes left until we hit Great. 530. Okay, 17 minutes we can do. Um, so let's move to ethics for a moment. And uh, I, am gonna, I am gonna go through a couple of these pretty fast, but I wanna mention the principle of proportionality, which again, you'll recognize this from the legal framework. It's essentially to use the least restrictive means to achieve uh, a, a public health goal. This applies to issues of restricting liberty. It applies to issues of resource allocation. It applies uh, in a lot of different contexts and it's gonna come up um, over and over again here. So. The ethical issues with regard to restricting liberty seem like they're very stark, like you've got public safety on one hand and personal liberty on the other hand. And Ron Bayer, um, I thought, put this very nicely, that the ethos of public health and of civil liberties are, as he called it, radically distinct. And I want to complexify that um, because I don't think it is actually that radically distinct. And the reason for that is that restriction attempts can actually backfire if they do not sufficiently attend to issues of personal liberty. So let me just acknowledge that all question, all ethical questions about when liberties might appropriately be restricted um, are in a sense predicated on the harm principle, which is this notion um, from you know, the libertarian himself, John Stuart Mill, that the only purpose for which power can be exercised over any member of a civilized community is to prevent harm to others. So therefore, there is really an, an ethical argument only arises if you know that whatever restriction you're trying to implement will actually work, right? It has to actually prevent harm to others. So the first task here in terms of an ethical argument is actually a medical and a public health argument. Will it work? And for the most part, people have talked about whether quarantine, other restrictions on liberty will work as being dependent on biological factors like the transmissibility of the illness or what are the treatment options or can people be infectious while not having symptoms and so on. I wanna point out that effectiveness also depends on social characteristics, right? So if you try and quarantine a bunch of people who do not have social cohesiveness, who don't trust, who don't accept the quarantine, your quarantine might not work. And we just finished this report up for the National Academies on um, the evidence base for public health emergency preparedness and response. This, by the way, was a two-year study that ended around March. So right as um, COVID was kicking off, we were completing our assessment of the evidence and the write-up on all of this. Uh, but the chapter on quarantine, I think, still uh, stands, even though we've learned a lot um, in the last nine months. And the fact is, people who fear being placed in quarantine can end up fleeing the area, potentially spreading the contagion further than it might have spread if you had not um, implemented, especially a mandatory type quarantine, right? Different from a voluntary quarantine. And this, by the way, is why we have, for the most part, seen 
only voluntary quarantines. Uh, there have been a couple um, enforced quarantines during this pandemic, but for the most part, we've really tried hard to use voluntary quarantine and, and moral suasion to get people to do the right thing because it is recognized um, that this can actually backfire. Does this actually happen? Yes. Um, during the SARS epidemic, there was a rumor that Beijing would be quarantined and 245,000 migrant workers fled the city. This picture is the Amoy Gardens apartment where the SARS uh, outbreak started in Taiwan. And the whole apartment complex was put under a mandatory quarantine. When the police arrived to enforce the quarantine, half of the apartments were empty. Similarly, when uh, it was threatened that uh, Wuhan, China was about to be locked down, 5 million people in a city of 11 million, 5 million people were gone when they locked down Wuhan. So this can actually happen. Um, it does actually happen. Um, and in the after action reports for the SARS epidemic, people in Taiwan felt like their over aggressive use of quarantine actually ended up contributing to public panic. Taiwan quarantined, by the way, over 150,000 people, 24 of whom ended up actually having SARS. So that's a very high rate of quarantining of otherwise healthy people who might have been exposed, but turned out they weren't exposed. And in the dark winter uh, bioterrorism exercise, Sam Nunn played the president. Um, and he said, you know, if you might think that um, the, uh, the stereotype of people from the Far East is that they're more compliant. Imagine trying to enforce a quarantine, um, you know, uh, on the city of Denver where half the population has uh, a, an SUV or a pickup truck and a gun. So um, the lesson here is that if you do por quarantine poorly, it can lead to mistrust and panic, and that is not merely ineffective, it can actually be harmful. On the other hand, um, what we have seen with COVID and uh, mathematical models prior to COVID suggested that even a leaky quarantine can help by smoothing the epidemic curve and reducing the rate of spread of an illness. And quarantine has to be looked at in light of other non-pharmaceutical intervention strategies, other uh, restrictions on liberty. So um, for example, mass screenings, a bad idea in general, um, at least for the illness SARS, it was a very bad idea, um, in part because people would end up lining up for mass screenings, um, and then they would end up passing uh, SARS around while waiting in line. And you could imagine something similar happening here if mass screening strategies were not um, appropriately uh, carried out. The other thing to say about this is, is respecting the sacrifices of those under quarantine. We've still not done a good job on this, even though we have repeatedly learned this lesson. Um, people placed in quarantine um, who end up losing their jobs uh, are not going to stay in quarantine. Um, people who fear going into a quarantine facility because, gosh, that's where the disease is, that kind of um, quarantine is probably not going to work and so on. Um, this has been a sort of hot topic. Could a mask mandate actually backfire? Um, because by mandating it, people say, you can't tell me what to do. And this, despite the fact that we have excellent evidence that mask mandates work, and I, I won't, or the masking works, sorry. This is, uh, let's talk first about masking. Masking absolutely works. This is the famous case uh, at Skagit, Washington, of one person uh, infecting 87% of his uh, choir mates. And by contrast, two hairstylists see 139 clients um, and didn't infect a single one of them because both the clients and hairstylists were wearing uh, cloth masks. Um, so face masking clearly works. The question is um, how best to get people to wear a mask. Is a mandate the best way to get people to wear a mask or could it end up backfiring? And I think what we've learned in the last uh, nine months is um, mask mandates can be quite effective. This came out last week from the CDC and it shows that at six different universities where they had people watch in uh, indoor and outdoor spaces, uh, whether people were wearing masks and whether they were wearing the mask correctly. And I know you're going to doubt this study because I doubted it myself, but um, because 90% just sounds like too many. I see so many people who are not wearing their mask correctly. 
But here's the thing, um, we're probably looking for that. Those of us in public health are looking to see people who aren't wearing masks correctly. If you actually count them up, one in 10, you probably notice that, but that's 90% effective use of a mask. That's actually quite good. So let me close with this around uh, mandatory interventions and what counts as a mandate. And just to recognize that there are a spectrum of enforcement mechanisms um, that can be uh, implemented for mandates. And there is some cost to tossing around the word mandate uh, loosely, right? So I'll go to this. Um, we have a bunch of mandates for common childhood vaccines. This is from the Annals of Internal Medicine a few years ago. And the lines here are when the mandate was implemented. And you can see what happens when these mandates are implemented. Um, even in cases where you know, things were already getting better, like pertussis, the mandate really you know, crushes these, uh, these illnesses. So the question is, when should you implement a mandate? And I'm, I'm talking about this because um, this is going to come up with uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, when should you mandate a vaccine? And the, re and the answer, in short, is that you have to mandate a vaccine when education of new generations of parents um, is difficult and becomes increasingly difficult because the vaccine is actually really good. And this is the paradox of highly successful vaccines that uh, they cause the risk of contracting the illness to decline um, as the vaccine is used. And so persuasion to continue using the vaccine becomes increasingly difficult. So my prediction is we are going to see mandatory COVID-19 vaccination eventually. Um, it's not gonna be this month or next month, um, although we'll probably start to see businesses um, implementing some mandatory vaccinations. And then very last point, um, we in public health need to recognize that the best evidence is that during disasters, during public health emergencies, as communities, our tendency is actually to be more generous and more cooperative towards each other than normally. Even though um, you sometimes hear people saying they need to avoid panic and that they're trying to um, you know, implement sort of strong arm tactics to avoid losing control of the situation. Panic among the public, uh, it can happen, but it is relatively uncommon. Um, political leaders, on the other hand, often want to be seen as responding forcefully to threats. And I put up a picture of Casey Hickox. Um, I think she's a Hopkins grad um, returning from uh, you know, e Ebola um, relief work and then um, put into quarantine for no reason uh, discernible except that a couple of governors wanted to look like they were being really strong on protecting everyone from Ebola. Very counterproductive. And I think um, it, there is a special obligation for those of us in health professions to guard against the inappropriate or counterproductive uses of police powers in crisis. And I will stop there. Questions for for Matt? If you unmute your phone, uh, I'll know you want to have a question. Really quiet out there. If you're shy, you can put a question in the chat. Well, Brian. Yeah, I'll just pop up on the screen. It was, um, thank you, Dr. Um, for the terrific talk. And it was nice to meet you earlier today. Um, and, and you're the person I'm most scared of getting the question, <laughs> knowing your background and expertise. <laughs> no, not at all, though. I mean, it was a really interesting talk. And I've been following those recent Supreme Court um, yeah. decisions as well. And I mean, I wonder what you think the right middle ground looks like? Because as you explained, there's certainly the potential for governments to overstep their legitimate public health authority. Um, and that's a place where we would want courts to intervene. Um, Buck v. Bell is a particularly um, egregious example of that. But um, so we don't want complete deference from from courts in a even in a pandemic, 
complete deference to state and local governments responding to a pandemic. Um, but it seems like we don't want judges to act as if it's there's not a pandemic going on <laughs> and as if governments aren't um, doing their best to, to respond even in ways that sometimes do impact individual rights and freedoms. And, and so I'm just wondering if, if you have thoughts about where that line is. Um, yeah. I think that, I mean, that is the question, right? Because it, it really is a spectrum and you can imagine um, like Elena Kagan's, um, Elena Kagan's dissent you know, is, is really well put together. Um, and yet she doesn't answer that question either, right? She essentially says, look, we should defer to public health authorities, period. They, you know, this armchair epidemiology by judges is gonna lead us to disaster. And, you know, and she even, she makes very emotional plea saying essentially, look, we're probably gonna end up killing people because of, um, because of our judicial overreach here into the public health sphere. And, um, and uh, you know, she, she may be right, but um, by the way, that may be okay, right? There are values at stake here beyond just saving the most lives during a pandemic. Um, and that's one of the most difficult things I think for many, of us to get our heads around is that in in the world we actually care about things um, in addition to saving the most lives um, and some of those things may include the right to show up and go to church together um, even during a pandemic and that is that is you know it's it's one of those things where it's really easy to say we should just let the science decide this um, but that's actually not how the real world works. Science doesn't decide everything. And I'm not sure that we even want a world in which science just decides everything, it, you know, a coldly utilitarian calculus about how best to use our resources um, might have us choose, you know, not to provide palliative care because why would we give, you know, if we're in a, if we have a morphine shortage, why would we give that to someone who's gonna die anyways? Right, that's utilitarianism at its very extreme. Um, and obviously no one wants to go there. So, uh, so the, the fact is these are, these are difficult balancing acts. And I don't think uh, Elena Kagan's got the answer. I don't think Chief Justice Roberts has the answer. And I, and I don't think I have the answer. Um, so it, it ends up being, you know, this, this moves from a substantive justice question. Can you write a rule that will always apply perfectly? to a procedural justice question. Can we make sure that the right people are at the table, that the right values are being taken into consideration, that there's a possibility for due process, for revisiting the, the decisions over time, right? I think that's probably where I would spend more of my time is thinking about what are what the process ways that a state could use to make these decisions so that when they do show up in front of the Supreme Court, they can say, look, we had this level of community engagement. We had real discussions about these balancing values. We took seriously the concerns of religious communities and, that, and then they can defend it. So that's, that's kind of where I would move because I think trying to find the, the cutoff is, uh, I won't say it's a fool's errand, but it's not gonna, it's not always gonna work. This is, Classic, by the way, I'm sure you know this, Brian, but for others who have never read HLA Hart, um, this is legal positivism, right? Um, the no vehicles in the park. Well, that's a nice rule, um, but does it apply to skateboards? Does it apply to a baby carriage? Does it apply to an ambulance, right? And if you try to write a rule that takes into account the nuances of real life, it becomes an unwieldy and un unmanageable rule. And so you have to have a, a process for interpretation of rules over time. That's great. That's a really helpful answer. Thank you. I think the process is the place to look. I think there's some questions in the chat, Dr. Vinia. Yeah. Um, what role do schools and school leaders play in demonstrating the ethical behavior related to COVID pandemic? Do their unique populations influence this? Um, yeah, this is a great question. Um, and it's a great question because uh, you are right now seeing this play out um, where there are 
you know, school districts that are wanting to open and teachers um, and their representatives who are saying it's not safe yet. Um, and you've got politicians sort of stepping into this breach and, or into this fray, I should say, um, and adding fuel to the fire, unfortunately. Um, because what we're what we know, um, and again, this is not this isn't actually my area of specialization, but my understanding is that there are ways to open schools relatively safely, even if not everyone is vaccinated. They cost money. Um, they require, you know, um, resources that a lot of schools are not don't have um, and are not likely to get in the very near future, um, absent uh, absent, you know sort of different uh, priorities um, at the state uh, level. Um, and so I think these are going to get, uh, these are going to get sort of litigated out. Um, so the moral question, the ethical question here is, you know, do school leaders have a responsibility to set the good example? And the answer is yes. The question then is what example is that? Um, and that's where the disagreement is, right? Because there are people who say, well, the good example we should be setting is don't let them force you to go back to work until it's really safe. And others who are saying the example we should set is, look, perfect safety is never, you know, doesn't exist. And um, let's, let's be sort of realistic about what the, what the level of safety is that we're going to get um, in, in the short term. Uh, so that's probably an unsatisfying answer, but most of my answers are unsatisfying. Uh, we t so this is from Len Rubenstein. We tend to discuss questions of liberty restrictions only in terms of the validity of the restrictions, the Syracuse principles approach. What we've learned in this pandemic, it seems, is A, we need to provide forms of support uh, for people who have to live with those restrictions, absolutely. And I think I mentioned, this isn't the first time we've learned that. We learned that during pan flu, we learned that during SARS, we learned that during Ebola. Like every time we have to relearn this lesson. Um, and then B, steps to protect people who are exempted from the restrictions from harm, such as essential workers. And yeah, I could not agree more. There are people and you know, school teachers among them, but um, let's talk meat packers, right? Uh, meat processing workers, other food processing workers who are essentially not being allowed um, to, uh, to isolate themselves, to quarantine themselves, to, uh, to practice social distancing. And what are we doing to protect those people where we know there have been enormous outbreaks um, in those um, food processing facilities and so on. And I think both of those, you're absolutely right, Len, both of those deserve um, you know, the attention they have been getting and more. Um, how do you make it safe and easy for people to do the right thing? when they uh when when doing the right thing is costly to them both on the side of we're asking you not to go to work and on the side of we're asking you to go to work um in both of those instances we really need to be uh, looking at how we as a community can appreciate the sacrifice that we are asking those people to make uh april sharp says uh, nicely stated how these public health concerns have all occurred before and will likely occur again. I'm glad you heard that. <laughs> I think I've said it two or three times now. Um, how do we use public health to help people not forget everything we've learned socially and scientifically in preparation for the next pandemic? Or is forgetting of some benefit? Wow, I love the last part of that question. Uh, I will say the the question about how do we ensure that we don't forget things is really interesting um, when you compare public health and medical science, right? Medical science clearly builds on itself year after year, generation after generation, we get better and better at it because we have a research base, because we collect data, because we do randomized controlled trials, we do observational studies, the whole project that I mentioned with the National Academy of uh, Sciences on the, on the evidence base for public health emergency preparedness and response, the big sort of banner headline from that work was there is no evidence base. We don't do research on this in the way, I mean, uh, that's obviously an exaggeration. There is research that happens, very good research that happens. Um, but we, are, we do not have the infrastructure 
of the NIH to do research on public health preparedness and response. Um, and that is a culture shift that really ought to happen within the public health community, right? The notion that you could come out of a wildfire, out of, a, uh, out of an outbreak, and the learning is an after action report, which is almost entirely qualitative, um, which is liable to political considerations, right? Uh, after, after action reports are not probably where you're going to go to find out that, you know, the governor really should have behaved differently. Um, so I, I, I think we in the public health community, are, it is incumbent on us to develop the public health research base on which we can get better, you know, from one crisis, one disaster to the next. And we've got the model for this in medicine, actually. Uh, we have the model for this in the clinical subspecialties. That culture of research um, just isn't quite there in public health. Um, and then you ask this really provocative other uh, question, is forgetting of some benefit? And I have to imagine you're reflecting on some of these um, sort of emotional valence of going through a disaster. Um, there are, of course, people who come out of a disaster more resilient than ever. Um, that's not an uncommon experience, but there are also those who come out of a disaster um, burned out uh, and, uh, and, um, and traumatized. Um, I think in, in one of my slides that I went through rather quickly, a, a third of the people who had to be quarantined during the SARS pandemic, uh, epidemic rather, in uh, Toronto, ended up with a clinical PTSD afterwards. So, um, so I think there may be something about forgetting uh, at the individual level. Um, I would like to believe that if we had better systems for data gathering and analysis and reporting and learning together as a community, um, that that would be of, of benefit though to the, to the larger community. Sam, you're gonna jump in and tell me when we're running out of time, right? Um, at this point, you're over 5.30, uh, but, yeah, you know, there's no limit on this. So. No, no limit, no limit. No limit. Yeah, you can go. <laughs> we have one more question. In well, the yeah, I'll certainly um, give my opinion on the, on the idea of a mandatory COVID vaccination, because Karen uh, Rothenberg asked this question, and I think it, it belies that we probably have a similar view on this, um, which is that while under an EUA, an emergency use authorization, um, the vaccination, strictly speaking, is still, in quotes, experimental. And um, from the bioethics standpoint, the idea of forcing someone to take an experimental product um, is just so anathema, it makes you know, every hair on your back of your neck stand up. Um, on the other hand, uh, the data are very good. They are gonna be, uh, auth you know, there will probably be a, a full, uh, a full approval, at, you know, sometime in the next couple months, um, and I think at that point this question becomes a little bit moot. Even so, I think, and I, again, I'm not a lawyer, but from my reading uh, of the of the cases on this, um, I think it could sustain a legal challenge. I, I think it could withstand a legal challenge, and even an experimental vaccine could be required. We, we've seen that before um, with anthrax vaccine in the military, for example, and that's a federal requirement, which generally has less protection than a state-based requirement. The other thing I'll just add on this, I think the first place we're gonna start to see mandatory vaccination is not at the state law level, it's gonna be businesses. So it's gonna be the private sector where they say, look, if you wanna fly on our airplane, you gotta be vaccinated. And I think that would sustain, I think that would uh, withstand a challenge. Although I'd love to hear from others on the, on the call who you know, are more legal experts than I. Well, I think, hi, this is Karen. Yeah. I think the um, military, that's a whole different game. The military has a lot of authority to tell people in the military what they're going to do. And you're right, if you're talking about business, it's a different, legal analysis than if you're talking about the government, because yeah. you don't have the constitutional issues. However, you could have 
an impact that's disparate or it appears to discriminate against certain groups. And it's probably not really good public policy unless there's such a good argument on the contrary. So we've seen this with flu shots. Yes. You know, healthcare institutions mandate them and some people don't want to take them and then they lose them in an area where there's a shortage. So it's a balancing act. I, I mean, I'm, I've, my position has been as long as it's an emergency use, I think it would be difficult to mandate it. Um, but there yeah, are some I, settings I where it is. Yeah. I don't know if it would be difficult, yeah. but I would think it's a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, as a practical matter. Um, and also a lot of people that, that it is mandated, i.e. home health care aides, they don't have the mechanism to, to challenge it. I mean, either they're going to lose their, they have to get, the resources in order to be able to make the challenge or know where to go to make the challenge. So I think a lot of people are just experimenting with it, see what happens until there is the first case. So I, I didn't realize that the emergency uses would be over in, in the next few months. That's what I, what I, so, so I can't say that I'm not in the FDA, um, but the, the rumor that I've heard is that probably late spring, is when you'll see the first okay. one actually a full okay. approval. But thank you. Anyway, great talk. Thank you. If anyone else has a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, and uh, the, Lily and uh, Joe Brin are asking if businesses were to do some kind of a, you can't come in if you haven't had the vaccine, wouldn't that be a problem when you've got a shortage of vaccine? And not everyone who wants it can get it. And I think that's entirely, uh, th that's why I don't think you're gonna see that until, that you're not gonna see mandates until, you know, at least summertime for regular workers. I think it is possible that you could see mandates in hospitals or like you said, Karen, with home health aides, places where you have access to the vaccine and, you, but you've got a few people who've, who've uh, you know, elected not to receive it for one reason or another. Um, not and, a few people, <laughs> not a few people, most, more than half. Yeah, in the well, nursing we'll see, yeah, well, I think we'll see what happens over the next few months. That's the, yeah. this is the yes. big unknown right now is where this is going, right? The, the numbers are going like this and the acceptance rates are, are going up. They're, you're right, they're not great. But we also started from such a terrible baseline of this, <laughs> right. uh, right. of this particular vaccine, right? There were there are a bunch of people who normally are not vaccine hesitant, but are vaccine hesitant about this vaccine. Well, th thank you, everyone. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to, to meet and speak with all of you. And um, it is weird doing this on uh, uh, on a Zoom call instead of where I can actually see you. And thank you all. But uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.